you know, at Whole Foods Market, you know, we have a culture and a community in the store and people feel it and they like being a part of it. Yeah. And we have fun with our customers. And yeah, yeah retail's dynamic. It, you know, I'd much rather be on the floor working than sitting at a desk. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to episode 147 of the Commando Voice. Today, I speak with a manager of Whole Foods for over 18 years. Welcome to the podcast, Otto Loischel. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Camino Voice podcast, where I interview local business owners, comedians, singers, and more. I dive into their backstory to find out how they got where they are, what are some of the tips for you to do the same, and find out where they are going. Tune in every week as I interview more of the people you see every day. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Camino Voice, where we release a new episode every Tuesday. Uh, hope your day and week is going well uh, this previous week. Um, I just celebrated my 13th year anniversary with my wife. Uh, if you saw that on the Instagram, then you already knew that. And if you didn't see it on the Instagram, it means you might not be following me at the Camino Voice. So be sure to do that and follow me there. Um, we got to go to Jazz Alley, which was great. We had never gone there. We got to see a new gal who is only, I believe, 22 years old, who is amazing. Um, and of course, I can't remember her name right now. But um, great time, great food. Uh, love the environment there. Um, so hopefully we'll be visiting there for many, many more years. Um, yeah, so that was great. And uh, the sun is here, at least temporarily. So we are happy. We are enjoying the sun. And uh, life is good. So... Um, Otto Loischel. Wow, that was a clap. I apologize in advance if that blew out any eardrums. Um, <laughs> Otto Loischel. So from the intro, you might be slightly confused of why I'm bringing on a manager of Whole Foods uh, onto the podcast. Um, but what struck me with Otto, even from the, the first little conversation I had with him in line uh, here at the marketplace, was his love for retail and his understanding of it. Um, and you'll hear that in this uh, podcast. Just he enjoys the retail environment. He really believes that it is a type of business that is like none other. Uh, you get these interactions that you don't get in any other business. Um, you get to make people's day by these little tiny gestures and moments. Um, and really, I think, emphasized and, and showed uh, uh, why... Our, I have our mission statement here at the marketplace of bringing joy to the Camino Island community um, through a food service and drink because it's the little interactions that matter. Um, you know, not all of us are world slayers or out there, uh, you know, doing everything, but we can all be a part of that change. And in the retail, you get a every single day, every moment you get a chance to make someone's day. Um, and I really got that from Otto, just from that really quick, brief interaction I had with him. So from there, I was like, hey, I have a podcast. Would you be willing to come on it? And he was like, sure, why not? Um, so we had a great time uh, talking about all the aspects of retail, his story. Um, I learned a lot just talking with him and uh, kind of just refired me up of just like why we do what we do. Um, so without further ado, here's my conversation with Otto Loischel. Just kidding, it's Brandon again jumping in. Just letting you know, I will not be posting an episode next week because I will be out on vacation. So my next episode is going to be on July 19th. So see you guys then. Okay, here, on with the episode. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Commando Voice. Today I'm here with a manager at Whole Foods for 23 years. Welcome to the podcast, Otto Loischel. It's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So before we get started, tell us a little bit about Otto. Well, I was uh, born in Snoqualmie, Washington. Okay. I uh, grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we were a warehouser family. And uh, so my father, as he climbed the corporate ladder, we moved all over the Northwest, Tacoma, Coos Bay, uh, Snoqualmie, Bellevue a couple of times, Longview, and then uh, Portland is where I went to high school. Okay. Yeah. 
Nice. What was it like growing up kind of all over the place for you? Well, it, we, it was great. It, I, it, we moved about every two years is kind of how the cadence went. Okay. And so our family was very used to going and starting over every two years. And I think it's had lasting impacts on our family. We're all, we've all lived in numerous places and been all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. How do you guys, how do you feel like as far as uh, beneficial uh, or benefits, how do you think that has benefited you as you've progressed in your career and your life and different things like that? To live all over? Yeah. You know, I think it's adaptability, a yeah. lot of it, um, because, you know, we would, you every two years you'd go and go to a new school and new friends. And um, so I think it, uh, we're all very adaptable and I have followed that pattern in my adult, adult life. Uh, you know, after college, I went uh, first to Texas, then to Northern California, then to New York. Uh, punctuated by a little trip to London, a year in London, then to the Hudson Valley, and then back to Camino Island. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I have a I have a seven to eight year pattern. <laughs> All of those places are seven to eight years. Okay. <laughs> nice. Very cool. So um, when you were in uh, high school then in Portland, um, what were you kind of looking at as far as looking ahead at college and stuff like that? Well, um, I wanted to go to New York or San Francisco. Okay. Um, I applied and was accepted to uh, two colleges, one in San Francisco and one in New York. But I had a little bit of a wild streak, and my parents decided it would better be better if I were uh, within a, a di an easy distance to them. <laughs> so we settled on the University of Oregon. Okay. <laughs> nice. So I, um, but I, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but uh, um, I wanted to live in cities like San Francisco and New York and uh but Eugene it was okay nice so what did you end up uh studying while you were there I majored in French French okay. yeah um and that was a little bit uh I my junior year in high school I was a foreign exchange student in Paris okay my entire junior year I went to a French high school wow. and I lived with a French family so I came back and finished my senior year of high school in Portland and uh, I wanted to go into business, and I wanted to get into the business school at University of Oregon, but my wild streak kind of persisted through college, <laughs> and my grades weren't good enough to get into the business school. Okay. And I even uh, appealed, and um, but it was a no. And so finally my parents said, Otto, let's find the quickest way to get you through out of college. <laughs> and French it was. <laughs> okay, sounds good. What was it like for you? You living in France for those two years then? It was one year. Oh, um, one year. It okay. was fabulous. You know, I was 17, 16 years old okay. uh, when I lived there, and it was the late 70s. <laughs> and not many people went to Europe then. It wasn't that common to go to Europe. Okay. Uh, and it was just amazing. You know, I went to a French high school, and every day as soon as school was over, I took the subway to the heart of Paris and just explored that town every day. Yeah. Uh, Paris is my favorite place in the world nice. by far. And it was great. I traveled all over Europe. You know, I got a Eurail pass and went all over Western Europe. Nice. And it was an amazing opportunity for a young man in the 70s to yeah. do that. And, uh, you know, kind of early on, I became a, what I think a citizen of the world. Okay. Very cool. So, uh, what were you actually living in Paris then, or were you kind of outside just of outside uh, Paris, in okay. the, uh, about fifteen miles outside of the northeast part of Paris? Okay, yeah, nice. Cool. Did you uh, get into soccer while you were over there for football? No, I've never been terribly athletic. <laughs> I'm just much more of a city guy. I would just go into the center of Paris and walk around and, you know, imagine myself someday being one of these fabulous people I saw walking around Paris. <laughs> Very cool. Have you got to go back? Oh, yes. Paris. I've been to Paris many times. Uh, I lived in London for a year okay. when I was with Whole Foods Market the first time. Yeah. Uh, and I uh, we bought a company in London called Fresh and Wild and Whole Foods sent me over to kind of start the integration. I was the only American living in London. Uh, and so I lived there for a year uh, on the company Dole, which was fantastic. Yes. Um, yeah. But the uh, train, the channel, you know, the train between uh, London and Paris was a three hour trip, something like that. So okay. I went to Paris all the time that year. <laughs> <laughs> Numerous times. Very cool. So here you are, you've, you've started, you've graduated with a French degree. Yep. What kind of happens after that? Well, I, for no apparent reason, when I got out of the University of Oregon, I wanted to move to Dallas, Texas. 
I'd never been there. I'd never known anybody who had been there. But I read an article about Dallas in the National Geographic. And the National Geographic, as you know, can make any place just look fantastic. <laughs> and, you know, it was the mid-80s. Yep. And, you know, this it was the height of the Dallas TV show. And it just it seemed like anybody who was in Dallas got rich. And I fancied myself as somebody who would go to Dallas and get rich. Uh, didn't happen, but I lived in Dallas for three years. Okay. Um, I worked in retail electronics there. Uh, and then um, I got a job offer to move to Houston in a similar type of store. It was retail electronics, kind of the gifts and trendy gifts for men in like Sharper Image okay. when it was at the height of its success. Yes. There were a bunch of knockoff stores, and I worked at two knockoffs, one in Dallas, and then I moved to Houston. And I worked for the company in Houston for about three years and had what I think everybody calls a quarter-life crisis. Okay. And uh, I quit the job, didn't have one to go to, and I was trying to find any job that wasn't retail. Couldn't find something acceptable, and so I ended up applying for this, uh, a cheese department manager for this little unknown company at the time called Whole Foods Market. Okay. Uh, in 1991, I joined Whole Foods Market for the first time. Uh, and it was still a private company. It we only had nine stores at that time, seven in Tex or uh, six in Texas, one in New Orleans, and two in uh, California. Okay. Uh, is that nine? Anyway, something like that. Yeah. So I started at the Houston store in 1991. Okay. Awesome. What was that like for you getting started? Because you were finally you were getting back into retail, um, kind of at a little bit new type of environment because you're working with food and stuff like that. What was that like getting back into retail? Well, it was amazing uh, because I've, I've actually been in retail my entire life. I mm -hmm. started working the day I was 14 when mm. you, in those days, you just had to get a work permit and yep. I've always worked in retail and I've continuously worked since I was 14 years old. And, um, you know, when I worked, started at Whole Foods Market, uh, again, no, no, my parents were like, what, who, <laughs> you know, nobody knew what Whole Foods was. Yeah. Um, but what I love about Whole Foods Market and grocery is it's Whole Foods makes retail so fun. Yeah. Um, and I love retail. I love being on the floor. I love, you know, handling product, cleaning, sweeping, working with people. And it's just an amazing company culture that yeah. just makes, you know, retail's not the most glamorous, you know, sought after career in right. the world, uh, but Whole Foods makes it fun yeah. and engaging and exciting. And I just, it wasn't, I actually, when I started at Whole Foods, I didn't intend to work there for more than a year. It was to buy some time to do a better job search. Okay. <laughs> and the rest is history, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, I think um, retail is a job that a lot of people get into as their first job. Yeah. And it, you know, for them, it is a passing through. They're just paying the bills until they get, get through college or whatever. Um, and it, like you said, it does get somewhat of a bad rep, especially, into, I would say, in today's day and age. We've now gotten to this point where you've got online retail. You've got, um, you know, deliveries. You've got Uber Eats. You've got everything that's delivering and picking up and... Um, so people are kind of always pushing that like, well, is this the death of retail or is this the death of retail? And there is a unique magic that comes with retail that you can't get over the internet. You can't get through delivery. You just, you get these interactions, these human interactions that just you don't get in many other businesses. I agree. I agree. And, you know, retail, yeah, it doesn't have the best reputation as a place to build a career, but retail is one of the biggest sectors of the economy. Yeah. And I do, I think bricks and mortar retail will power on. I yeah. really do. And a part of what I think is the magic of Whole Foods Market is the in-store experience, yeah. both for team members and customers, where it you know, at Whole Foods Market, you know, we have a culture and a community in the store and people feel it and they like being a part of it. Yeah. And we have fun with our customers. And yeah, yeah retail's dynamic. It, you know, I'd much rather be on the floor working than sitting at a desk, mm -hmm. you know. That's just my, some people like a desk job. That's great. It's not me. I get sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Very cool. So you, you keep mentioning this was your first stay with Whole Food Market. Uh -huh. So how long did, were you working with them during this time period? So uh, my first run was 17 years. So okay. after Houston, I moved to Northern California, mm -hmm. uh, the Bay Area, 
and I started, that was my beginning in uh, store leadership rather than being a team leader. Okay. And so I worked in Palo Alto first and then in Mill Valley, uh, which are near San Francisco. And then my first big job, you know, where I made my name for myself at Whole Foods Market uh, was our first store in San Francisco. Okay. Uh, because we had stores in the Bay Area, but uh, everybody who Li lived in the Bay Area, worked at Whole Foods Market, was dying for our first San Francisco store. Okay. So that's where I really kind of cut my chops, as they say, yeah. <laughs> as you'd say. Um, so I ran the San Francisco store for four years. Okay. Um, and then we, um, I was called to go to New York City uh, okay. by one of my main mentors in the company. So I moved to New York. And I opened our uh, first store in New York City, which was Chelsea on 24th Street and 7th Avenue. Did that for about two years, and then I opened our second store in New York, which was Columbus Circle. Okay. And right after we opened that store, we acquired that company I told you about in London called Fresh and Wild. So I moved to London, and as I said, it was a small company of six stores in London and one in Bristol. Okay. And I was the only American there, and it was really fun. They were just a young, fun company, and, you know, uh, I called them all, instead of my team members, I called them my subjects, and they called me your majesty <laughs> <laughs> they accommodated me <laughs> uh, I did that for a year and then I came back and I opened our third New York City store in Union Square and I ran that for about eight months and then I became vice president of operations for the Northeast region which was all the stores in Metro New York which okay. was New Jersey New York and Connecticut I did that for two years and you know being a vice president was a great job it just wasn't the right one for me yeah. You know, as I said, I'm kind of a retail guy and yep. being a vice president was much more of a desk job. <laughs> uh, so uh, um, I had kind of also, you know, after I said my quarter life crisis, my midlife crisis, where it just I, it was time to do something else. So yeah. I quit Whole Foods, okay. took a year off and threw myself into the universe. And uh, I had a house up in the Hudson Valley of okay. New York. And I was thinking about becoming a chicken farmer. Um, to raise eggs for Whole Foods Market because at that time the company was trying to develop more uh, smaller sources of pro animal products, yeah. uh, more raised to Whole Foods standards. Yep. And I was looking at all these farm properties in the Hudson Valley, and I was looking at this one in this little town called Germantown. Okay. And I, I heard two of the realtors talking about this little market that had been closed for a couple of years. And I kind of cocked my ear towards that conversation. I was like, hmm, I might want to check that out. Uh, so anyway, I found out about this little market uh, that had been called Central Market. It had operated for, oh uh, gosh, since from 1927 until 2006, continuously. Oh, wow. okay. Little small town grocery store yeah. in a little 300-year-old New York town. Make a long story short, I made an appointment with the realtor to see this store, uh, walked in, a uh, little, about 1,500, 2,000 square foot store that, you know, still had food on the shelves, but it had been closed for two years. Make a long story wow. short, I walked in, I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And okay. I bought it, uh, and I uh, renovated it, and uh, in December of 2008, I reopened it as Otto's Market okay. in Germantown, which had nice symmetry. Very yeah. German name with a little German town. Very cool. <laughs> so, real quick, I want to jump back. When you were over working in, um, in England, um, what was that like integrating? Because, you know, a lot of times these people take, uh, like, these retail takeovers and things like that as these very negative experiences. Mm -hmm. um, what do you feel like Whole Foods did to, one, mitigate that, but also what are the things they did right during that transition to make the new acquired company feel like they fit in? Well, I was only there for a year, and when I was there, we just operated the stores that existed. Okay. Since my tenure, Whole Foods has opened numerous stores in the UK, and I, uh, I've not been part of it since, so okay. I can't speak to anything after my time. Yeah. Um, but what was interesting is this little company called Fresh and Wild had such a similar culture to Whole Foods Market. Okay. In fact, the man who founded it what was of the natural foods industry in okay. the United States. So, you know, it was, it was very similar. And my job really was to kind of start introducing Whole Foods systems 
and Whole Foods, you know, business practices. Yeah. And they were very open to it. Yeah. Um, but, and they were, they really were excited to be part of Whole Foods Market. So it was more, uh, more than anything, I was the ambassador of Whole Foods Market. So, yeah. And they were very open. And I just, you know, that year just, you know, I didn't have a great understanding or feel of British culture and after a year I love Britain and I love Brits and watching this whole Jubilee thing just is so exciting because <laughs> they have such a unique culture yeah. that is and they're just so fabulous long-lived people too. so yeah. long lived yeah. yeah yeah very cool how did that how was that in comparison to your experience of work, living in France well, you know, when I was in France, I was so young. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was 17. Um, but, you know, I love having those experiences of living in different cities and yeah. being a part of it. Uh, you know, New York, too. You know, when I used to visit New York as a tourist, it just felt so, you know, I felt like such an outsider and like, oh, it must be, what must it be like to be one of these people <laughs> who's in this hustle and bustle? And I find that once you've lived in a city, you're forever a part of it. Mm. So anytime I go back to London or Paris or New York, I kind of feel like I'm part of it. Yeah. Not a tourist, which I love. Yeah. And I just love cities. Yeah. Uh, I'm definitely happy to live in the country now. <laughs> <laughs> I think my city days are behind me living in cities, but I do love visiting. Them. Yeah. And I love being part of the fabric of a city and just, you know, just be feeling like you're a citizen of the world. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're definitely fascinating. They're they're one of those uh, when you're in them and when you're whether you're living in them or visiting them, um, each one has its own feel to it. And yeah. they just um, it every time I do a, one of those things where you like almost go third person on yourself and you zoom out and you're like, how many people are in the squared area of where I am? And when you realize how many people are in just that area that you're never gonna probably meet or interact with or know their life story ever, and then you just can zoom out farther and it's just it's incredible when you think how many people on this earth that there are that you'll never interact with I mean I agree and past people too yeah. and that's one of the things I love about these older cities like Paris you know you're walking by these buildings like La Conciergerie which is a thousand years old yeah, and people have been you know jailed there a thousand years ago and you're walking by them and you know we're all little teensy specks of dust in this Universe, but just that you're a part of it for a moment yeah. is exciting to yeah. me. And awesome. I agree, you just see all these people, and you know, as small of a player as you are, you are a teensy part of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very cool. So um, then you find you, I mean, it's neat that you got to live in kind of all the different cities and stuff that you were wanting to as a kid. Yes. Um, and so when you moved up to Hudson Valley and, and you were opening Auto's Market, was that something you were see, like, had, from your experience at Whole Foods and everything, were you thinking like, eventually I want to open my own or? I, you know, it had always been kind of a uh, dream of mine to open my own little grocery store. Mm -hmm. I envisioned it happening more now where I am in my career, at the end of my career. Yeah. Um, rather than um, kind of in the middle of my career. Um, Part of it, too, uh, one funny story is when we lived, one of the places we lived as a family, a young family, was Longview, Washington. And, okay. Uh, we lived there, I think, like from 1968 to 1972. But we lived in this fabulous old house uh, right on the lake in Longview. And we had this unfinished attic. And as kids, we just love playing in the attic. Well, one of the things I used to do up there is play grocery store. Okay. And my mom would open all the cans from the bottom so I could display them so they looked like oh. they were full cans of groceries. Yeah. So she would open cans and save <laughs> them for me so I could build displays up in the attic. And so grocery was always, and I even have a picture of me playing grocery store when I was in first grade. That's fantastic. Um, it's, yeah. So I think my dream was to do it later, um, and but it happened, and it was an amazing experience. I loved it. Yeah. I, I, I thought it was going to be something I would do for the rest of my life. Um, it was a ton of work, but it was a really great market. People loved it, you know, and I got really good press. Yeah. Um, it was, re uh, you know, it was fun and it was just the center of the community. And also when I bought the store, I mean, this little town, Germantown, is like a town of 3000 people. Oh, wow. Okay. But it was 
dead. I mean, there was nothing left on Main Street except the liquor store. And everything had closed yeah. after over the years. Well, you know, um, when I opened this store, if you go to Germantown, you know, I, I was part of, reno of rejuvenating, um, or what's the word I'm looking for, reviving yeah. this 300-year-old town. And it is a vibrant little town now. There's a, a, a James Beard recognized restaurant. The liquor store is still there. My grocery store, I sold it. It's still called Otis Market. Yeah. Uh, there's about seven or eight different re really unique, interesting retail stores there, even more now. it's They're building a boutique hotel. It's exploded. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's amazing. It was really fun to be a part of that because this is an amazing community of people. Some... You know, people who have lived there all their lives, some people who can trace their roots back 300 years. Okay. And then a lot of New Yorkers who have second homes up there. Yeah. Uh, which is how I entered the Hudson Valley. I was a second homeowner and okay. then bought Otto's Market. Nice. Very cool. So when you were, obviously you had had experience working in a, a larger grocery store and, and you had been part of that as it's evolved into a larger grocery store. But what was it, what was different for you opening a, your own small market? Well, you know, Whole Foods Market, when I left was, you know, had become quite a big company and, yeah. and, you know, as a company, I started again when it was nine stores. I think when I left, we were probably 300 or 400 stores somewhere in there. Okay. Um, so, you know, it was, had become a very, uh, as big companies become very corporate and not in a bad way, but you know, just that you, every, we were standardizing a lot of things yeah. and to own your own store, you could do anything, <laughs> <laughs> say anything, <laughs> you know, just, it, it was total freedom Yeah. and you know, it was fun. Um, because although a Whole Foods Market did and still values creativity and, you know, empowerment and thinking outside the box, um, boy, when you own your own store, you absolutely can do anything you want. Yeah. And what was fun, too, you know, Whole Foods Market has very specific product and quality standards. When I had my own market, I didn't do a solely natural food store, even yep. though I'm passionate about natural foods. I was gearing my market to everyone, yeah. not just the natural foods customers. So I had your basic grocery store products with the best of the natural foods world and then European and imported products and a huge selection of local Hudson Valley products. Nice. So it was just fun because you just, there were very few boundaries, you know, it was limitless what you could do in your own space, in your own grocery. And I had fun with it. Yeah. You know, my plot product mix was very playful too. Yeah. And it, you, even though I didn't have a wide selection in each individual category, I had something. Yeah. And people would, my favorite thing is people would come in like, especially around the holidays and shop my store and they'd be like, wow, I got everything on my list. You know, <laughs> I, again, I, there were certain things like, you know, say a category like ketchup. I only had two choices, Heinz and an organic. Yeah. But, you know, that's all you need. Yeah. <laughs> or dish soap. You know, I had Dawn. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so it was fun because I was, I, I refined my product mix over time to really tailor it to my community. I, I hit it pretty well from the beginning, but I learned a lot as I went on and really tailored it to what my shoppers wanted. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And, and I've looked at your, um, where it's at now and kind of, it, I was looking at the website and the newsletter and everything. And, um, it does look like, I mean, it just looks like you guys had so many different like little events and different things that you guys had that integrated it into the community as more than just a store. Yeah, that's more the people I sold to. Okay. I, you know, I was so focused on the interior of my store. I never really got out that much. I mean, I was a, a involved in the community and I definitely was a player in the business community of the Hudson Valley, but all the community marketing and involvement is really after me. Okay. And they have just, it's, I, it, I get so excited when I read their newsletters and I'm like, why didn't I do that? <laughs> <laughs> but again, I was so, I was very internally focused, yeah. but it is amazing. I love their newsletter and they are involved in every 
every event and just and they're also really really involved in you know the environmental movement they just it, the woman one of the women who is one of the owners is so passionate about you know uh, protecting our environment and what she's done with my market um, vis-a-vis the environment in the community is things I didn't do and never got to and I'm it's exciting to see yeah yeah well and in one of the newsletters that I, I clicked on it was celebrating a, a team member they had had for I think 13 years oh yeah and I was like that's crazy. Was it Joan? I, I think it was Joan. Think so yeah. Yeah. Well, what's great is, um, you know, uh, and this is also a tribute to the new owners, or yeah. I guess they've owned it six years now. <laughs> <laughs> but the people who bought it from me is m- almost all of my, uh, the people that worked with me when I left are still there. Jen had been with me since I opened it in 2008, so she must have been there now 14 years. Oh, wow. Joan. Uh, Chad, Nancy, Patty, uh, uh, you know, I'm forgetting a few, I'm sure, but they're, they're all still there, wow. which is a testament to the new owners, too. That's great. Yeah. 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 Awesome. So with that, then, what kind of eventually led you to sell Auto's Market? Well, um, my parents, uh, we, as I said, we grew up in the Northwest, and my parents lived in Portland until about, I want to say, the late 80s. And then my father... Uh, my father and I have very similar career tracks. Okay. He had been with Warehouser for uh, 17 years and then went out on his, uh, did, did different things for a number of years, ending up with buying a sawmill in Arlington. Okay. Um, and he bought the sawmill and ran it, I don't know how many years, I want to say maybe six years. Uh, but they moved up here and they moved to Camino Island okay. over on Sunset Drive. <laughs> And um, so my father ended up, uh, it came time for him to sell his business, and he went back to Warehouser and finished his career there. Okay. Very similar to what I'm doing. Yeah. But anyway, so they lived here, they moved here in the late 80s and loved Camino Island, and both my parents were so active in Camino, very well-known people. Yeah. Um, But anyway, um, my father was clearly getting towards the end of his life in about... uh, you know, mid the mid 2000, about around 2015, his health started declining. Okay. And it was clear that somebody needed to be here after he passed to be near my mother. Yeah. None of us lived in the Northwest. We all oh, okay. went our different ways, yeah. as I said. So, um, and you know, um, I loved having Auto's Market, but um, you know, it, it just, I felt it was my calling. Um, I was, kind of the obvious one to come back in my family. I'm the youngest. I'm the only boy. My sisters were all very established in their communities, as I was, but it just, it felt like I was the right one to come back. So I moved here uh, in uh, winter of 2016. I had already been preparing to move here, um, and which I think put my father at peace. Uh, He died in uh, early January of 2016, and I moved here in late January of 2016. So okay. the timing was perfect. Very close, yeah. Yeah. And I uh, lived with, so I moved back to be with my mother. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So then uh, you moved back. Did you, were you kind of off work for a while then, just kind of staying here? Or? No. When I decided to move back, I um, kind of, I thought, uh, you know, I would love to go back to Whole Foods Market mm-hmm. um, if I'm going to move back to the Northwest. And uh I looked at uh, the stores they had, and the closest one to Camino Island was Linwood. Um, and then um, I kind of looked at a map, an atlas of Washington, to see if there was any other cities near Camino that might have a Whole Foods Market someday. And I saw Bellingham. I thought, huh, that looks like the biggest city between Linwood and Camino Island. And so I um, did a Google search, Whole Foods Market Bellingham, to see if they had a store here. Yeah. And they didn't, but uh, there was an article that said Whole Foods Market is planning to open a store in okay. Bellingham in spring of 2016. Wow. So I thought, hmm. So I emailed the <laughs> regional president of Whole Foods Market, who I had known since my days in Northern California, uh, a man named Joe Rogoff, and I emailed him and I said, hey, Joe, it's Otto Leuschel. Um I'm moving back to the Northwest. I see you're opening a store in Bellingham. If you're interested in uh, an old timer from company history, I'd love to come open that store for you. And 
the rest is history. Wow. I applied for the job and got it, and I opened that store in uh, May of 2016. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. So, um, so one of the things that I think Whole Foods, um, you've meant again, we've kind of been hinting at throughout this whole time, that they really value the team. They have this fun culture um, about retail of like it's not just you know check your boxes and clock in clock out. Like there's a whole culture of fun and stuff like that there. How do you think that? And you've been there for so long. How do you feel like they developed that over time? Because in a single market, like when you had your uh, one store, it's easier to control the culture and have an effect on that. But how do you do that as you get out of that point? I think what has made Whole Foods market culture so strong, and it does survive, to me it's a few things. Um, Whole Foods market as a company just does the right thing. When I joined in... Uh, 1991 at the store in Houston, it was the height of AIDS. And, you know, the disease was just, there was no hope. There were some treatments, but all they did was extend the agony, hoping for something else. Mm -hmm. And when I started at this store in Houston, there were maybe five or six men at that store who were at different stages of the disease. Yeah. And um, it was a cruel disease, too, because when people had AIDS, you could see it. Mm -hmm. It was obvious. Um, and the general public could be very cruel, too. And this was also a time, too, there was a lot of fear. There were no laws protecting people with AIDS. There were no, no laws stopping insurance from being canceled for people with AIDS. Mm -hmm. And um, here, this private company in Texas took care of those men and yeah. kept them employed and kept them insured until the end. In fact, there was kind of a rotation of jobs that because their physical capacity diminished and also, as I said, you know, appearances, it was hard. Mm -hmm. You know, they looked sick and it was, the public could be cruel. Yeah. Um, where, you know, at a certain point when they were still able to work but not fit to be on the floor, they would go upstairs and help cut and laminate signs. Okay. But, you know, this private company that didn't have to do any of this did it. And in some cases, like this one guy was disowned by his family um, wow. because he had AIDS and because he was gay. <laughs> um, you know, Whole Foods Market took care of him until the end, the team members, and in also took care of his final service and his... Cremation. Wow. And to me, a company that does that, and they didn't have to, there were no laws, but they did, we did. And it just, I think, even in, in this day and age, an Amazon-owned company, I think Whole Foods would still do the same thing. Yeah. Um, the second thing, too, is at Whole Foods Market, everyone has a place at the table. Um, Almost everybody who's in a leadership position or a corporate position at Whole Foods Market is homegrown. Okay. And, you know, including me, you yeah. know, I, when I first started advancing at Whole Foods, you know, into store leadership, you know, it was a different era. It was the early 90s, and I was one of the first openly gay people to start advancing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people said, oh, you're not going to get that far. It's not true. You yeah. know, I was met with open arms every step of the way. And as I've told you, my career, yeah. I had a really good career. Yeah. And I was one of the first. Yeah. Um, you know, um, one woman, I just, I was just in Texas last week at a Whole Foods event. I saw one of my favorite team members of all time, this woman I hired as a cashier in Chelsea. Oh, wow. In New York City. Um, she, her name is Janine Gordine. She was from the roughest part of New York. Mm -hmm. She was raised in the projects. Yeah. She didn't have, you know, uh, the kind of parenting and family life I had. Yeah. Um, she didn't have higher education. She didn't, before working at Whole Foods, she had only worked at places like McDonald's and Burger King and your basic entry retail young woman. Yeah. Um, to make a long story short, Janine Gordine came in, started as a cashier, moved up the ladder step by step by step, and she became a 
store team leader of one of our Manhattan stores, making a nice six-figure income. Mm -hmm. Now she's a store team leader in one of our New Jersey stores, and uh, she's a huge success. Yeah. And, you know, I come from that 1960s, very privileged, white, everything was laid out for me, college was paid. She came from a very different background, yeah. yet we ended up in the same place. Yeah. And that's what I think is the beauty of Whole Foods Market is everybody has a place at the table. Yeah. It's not who you are. It's not your background. It's what you do. Yeah. And now, too, you know, uh, uh, as the world changes, trans people are moving up through our company ranks, too, just yeah. like anybody else. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are at Whole Foods. It's what you do. Yeah. And I think that's the magic of the culture. The last thing, too, is if you work in a Whole Foods market, too, it's a community. Mm -hmm. And my store, I feel, is the same thing. It's a community of friends. It's yeah. warm. People, young people, it's mostly young people in retail. <laughs> I'm a dinosaur now. <laughs> but they come in and they find friends. And a lot of relationships are formed at a Whole Foods market. Yeah. And, you know, when adversity happens, like I told you, people rally around yeah. and help. And it's just, it is... Uh, our culture endures. Yeah. And it's magical. Yeah. So um, when you've brought in, because as you say, <clears throat> lots of you bring in these young new people. How do you bring people along? This is something that I'm, oh, I'm trying to get better at as a, as a company is it's easy when you hire someone that just happens to be a rock star because right. immediately they hit the ground running, they're going and yeah. they don't, you don't need to tell them what to do. They know what to do. They do their thing. How do you bring people along that you think that there's some potential there, but they're just not quite hitting that yet? Yeah. How do you bring people along when you're doing that? Well, I think what Whole Foods has taught me um, for my own store, because I had that exact thing mm -hmm. um, in my own store as well, and it still does, um, I think a culture of feedback is really what Whole Foods um, does well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, you hire, a, some people are rock stars. Yeah. They're just going to be rock stars. They're going to be fantastic no matter what. Mm -hmm. And then there's some people who are not great. Yeah. And they're not going to be great no matter what. <laughs> you know, it's just reality. There's yeah. some people who are just terrible workers. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are in the middle. Yes. And they're kind of, you know... I think a lot of them, if they're in, have positive influences and see that people advance and see that those people who have good work habits, who, you know, work hard, who have a good work ethic, who show up, who have good attendance. Yeah. Um, anybody who's worked with me knows my, one of my number one things is attendance. You got to show up. <laughs> you know, I'm a person, I don't miss work. I don't call out. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. And, you know, you have to show up. And so I think, you know, um, and when you do see people who have a lot of good work habits, have potential, but need some work, um, you have to give feedback on a timely basis, in a respectful way, and in a way that shows that you want, you believe in them, you think they can do better, and you are cheering them on. Yeah. And if they do better, keep cheering on. Uh, Janine, the woman I told you about from New York. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had a lot of tough conversations with her along the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, she listened. And I think, you know, she, and I think I'm not the only person who believed in her, but I'm certainly somebody that she knew believed in her. Yeah. And believed she could do better. Yeah. And um, it can be a lot of work. It's easier to... You know, tough conversations are hard for everyone, yeah. but to really help somebody grow, you have to be able to say the tell the truth. Yeah, this is what this is what you need to do. This is why. This is what the better result for you will be. Yeah, you can act a hundred different ways. You can do a hundred different things, but what is going to get you the best result? Yeah, you know, if you, and if you see they have a desire. Yeah, to be better, to be a part of it you know, w help them with a roadmap yeah. to get there. Yeah. And you have to be able to deliver the tough, tough conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the um, books I've read, they talk about that and they talk about 
um, one of their favorite phrases that they use is to be unclear is to be unkind. Yes. And I think a lot of times, you know, this is where I struggle a lot of times is I end up, uh, you almost beat around the bush because you're like, I don't yeah. want to hurt their feelings. But, but then you get done with the conversation. They have no idea what you are actually addressing. Correct. And they go back out and they do the same thing. And you're like, oh, we had this whole conversation. Yeah. But if you're not clear... They had no idea that that was what you were bringing them in to talk to them about. I think a lot of people want to lessen the blow by either sugarcoating or what we call sandwiching. Yes. You know, start with the positive, get to the negative, and end with the positive. And it's a mixed message. Yeah. I mean, of course you want to try to point out positive, but you can't mix your agendas too much. Yeah. I mean, if you really want to change behaviors, you have to really address the behavior in a clear and concise way and not mix your messages too much. And B, it's it's uncomfortable to deliver yeah. a hard message sometimes because yeah. you are dealing with somebody's self-esteem yeah. and self-image, and sometimes people don't see it. Yeah. Um, but it is more kind to, to address it head-on, to deal with it, um, so they can understand and make the change. Yes. Um, and, um, you know... And be, you can do that with compassion and kindness, yeah. too. You really can. Yeah, and respect. And That's respect. That's a big thing. Yeah. Um, but you do have to really be careful about mixing messages. Yeah. yeah. That's very <laughs> because good. Because if you sprinkle negative and positive together, a lot of people just will take the positive with them. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the other thing that you mentioned uh, is, you know, Amazon purchase Whole Foods. Um, I can't remember exactly when. but you know, 2017, I okay. believe. Yeah. So, um, with that then, how has that, or has it affected or changed um, things within the Whole Foods market, within the culture, within the how things run? You know, um, interestingly, I believe Amazon has, um, for the most part, uh, kind of let Whole Foods market be Whole Foods market. Mm -hmm. uh, it is funny, you'll have customers come in and say, oh, ever since Amazon took over... <laughs> Well, no, it's Whole Foods Market that made the change. Um, you know, I think it, it um, Amazon is, I think Amazon's an amazing company. And I think that Amazon, um, you know, uh, is the potential, especially Amazon does, as far as I understand, want to really grow their grocery business in general. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it, to, to me, it's exciting to be a part of something so big. Yeah. You know, I'm proud to be a part of, you know, Amazon, yeah. one of the biggest, most successful companies on the planet. As far as change, I don't, I think most of the change that Whole Foods Market that I've experienced since coming back to the company, which I came back just a year before Amazon acquired Whole Foods Market. Yeah. Um, I think that um, most of the change is generated by Whole Foods Market. Um, I really do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and one thing I'll, I'll mention, um, uh, I read uh, Tony Shea's book about Zappos, and mm -hmm. I believe in that book he goes through the whole Amazon transition and stuff, but that was something that I did think was really impressive about how that all went, because Amazon did really let Zappos continue to be Zappos. Yeah. They didn't, like, roll it into Amazon no. dot shoes or, you know... They let the culture stay because that's what they wanted. They wanted to capture that culture. And yeah. um, as far as like we've gone through the, I would say like the 80s and 90s where when the big company took over, like you knew big changes were coming. It was going to get more corporate. You were probably going to let a bunch of people go. Yeah. Culture was going to change. Like you knew kind of what to expect. And I do feel like as big as Amazon <clears throat> is, they've learned something from that, that they don't come in and just wholesale and change everything. They come in and let the company be the company it was, yeah. and they kind of work in the background. Um, I, I do think that is the experience. Uh, for instance, I know no one from Amazon. I mean, okay. I, I'm mid-level at this point, you yeah. know, being a store team leader. But my impression is, is that the connection between Amazon and Whole Foods Market is only at the highest level. Yeah. They didn't replace anyone that I'm aware of at the corporate level. It's yeah. still, there's a CEO. In fact, John Mackey, our founder and CEO, uh, is still there. Okay. He's retiring this year, um, and there's a new CEO who's from Whole Foods Market, but all the executive leadership uh, is 
still people I know <laughs> who I cool. grew up with in the company. They're all still there. Yeah. And it's fascinating. Uh, almost everybody, just about everybody who is at the high level are people who grew up in the company like me. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that aspect of it. Um, the people that do start in the company and move up through yeah. it, they just have the, a full understanding, a, a well-rounded understanding. Absolutely. In fact, Christina Minardi, who is one of the highest, I, I, I'm so confused at titles anymore, yeah. but she's in the top five of executive leadership in yeah. our company now. Uh, you know, I was a co-store team leader with her when I went to New York. Yeah. And she was one of the first per persons I met. I, you know, know her uh, her family. I, you know, know Christina extremely well. We talk all regularly. I'm going back to New York in the fall and I'm going to visit with her. And, uh, but she's one of the top dogs now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah that's, it, there's definitely something to be said for people that have to, that go through all of that because yeah. they, they fully understand every little piece in between. And she does. Yeah. You know, she has run a Whole Foods market. Yeah. <laughs> for a lot of years. And every step she's taken, she started as an assistant mm -hmm. store team leader, associate okay. store team leader. And, and, you know, and I think people who get to that level at Whole Foods Market who have grown up with the company, they don't forget where they came from. Yeah. And she still, she still goes into a store and she just, boy, you know, she, you know, she's in there. Yeah. She's around saying hi to everyone. She knows everyone. She's, you know, and she's one of us. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Well, I like to end every podcast with some rapid fire questions. All right. So the first one is what purchase of a hundred dollars or less have you enjoyed the most in the last three months? Oh gosh. Let me see. Uh, uh, less than a hundred dollars. Well, I buy plants all the time. Okay. I have a five acre property over about five miles away from here. Okay. And plants are my passion. So nice. I'd say, I, and plants. Nice. Perfect. <laughs> my mother actually, uh, uh, who just passed uh, this year, actually. Mm. Uh, she inspired my love of landscaping and gardening. Nice. Uh, so, uh, yeah, she used to roll her eyes at how many plants I buy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's continued since she's gone. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Who is the most influential person in your life outside of your family? You know, I would say it would be... Probably, um, gosh, that's hard to say. It would be one of my Whole Foods mentors. I have several. Some of my mentors went on to be the kings of the company. Yeah. Uh, one in particular, I'd say, is uh, a man named Will Paradise. Uh, he, I was his assistant when I was in Mill Valley in the 90s. And then when I became store team leader at San Francisco, he was my direct, who I reported to. He okay. was vice president. And, you know, I'm now, we're lifelong friends. Uh, he comes, been to my house. He came soon after my mother died to hang out with me. Mm. Uh, with uh, another one of my mentors, Dave Landon, two, the two guys who produced me at Whole Foods Market, okay. took me under their wings. But he's just an amazing man who, um, you know, who has changed, really influenced the way I think about yeah. the world and people. And I'm a uh, godfather to one of his eldest daughter. Oh, very yeah, cool. Yeah, just a good guy. Nice. All right. <clears throat> All right, this is a fill-in-the-blank question. It's, I know this is weird, but I've always wanted to blank. Oh, boy. Mm. Sing. Yeah. I would love to be able to sing or play the piano or be musical. Yeah? You don't want to hear me sing. <laughs> Not even happy birthday. <laughs> Whenever I try to sing at work, people say, yeah, keep your day job. And I've always thought, wouldn't it be, I, maybe it's something you could learn. And one of the, I, my bucket list when I retire is to either learn how to play the piano. I took our family's piano, so I'm committed. Nice. <laughs> and maybe learn to sing, but you know, uh, boy. If you're gonna teach me to sing, you're probably gonna go through some agony to get me on to, to yeah. All Ugh. right. Uh, who is an interesting or fascinating person that I should interview next? Hmm. Gosh, let me think. Um, hmm. Ooh, I got a, 
I wish I had had these before. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think on that a All second. Right. No problem. And you can also email me those later on. So uh, okay. that's that's how I get a lot of my upcoming guests, though, is I actually will reach out to previous guests. And yeah. Guests. So excellent. Awesome. All right. And lastly, what piece of advice would you give your 20 year old self? Live in the world. You know, <laughs> just go live in the world. Live out loud. You know, you're only young once. You'll hear it. <laughs> yeah. But you don't know. I'm turning 60 on Wednesday. Okay. Yeah. Happy and birthday. Thank you. <laughs> but go live. Yeah. You know, um, and I always encourage people to travel. I think travel, there's nothing more that is more, get educates you more on history and the world than travel. <laughs> used to drive me crazy when I lived in uh, New York and upstate New York, uh, when the Hudson Valley, you know, some people who live up there, you know, they live two hours away from one of the most amazing cities on the planet and they'd never go. <laughs> like, what are you doing for your vacation? Oh, hanging out here. It's like, why don't you go to New York? <laughs> but you know, I just live out loud, go yeah. out and live in the world and, you know, be yourself. You know, I had a, I had wonderful parents and my father, uh, you know, just was the best father. And he just told me, Otto, be yourself, be authentic, you know, don't just live out. And especially the way the world now, it seems the world is just ex more and more as time goes on, accepting everybody for who they are, how they identify. I know there's a lot of controversy even now, but I grew up in the 70s when, you know, yeah, it was a not an acceptable thing to yeah. be gay. <laughs> yeah. And now it's just, you know. There's ev steps forward. There, it's amazing. It's a whole different world than it was 40 years ago. Yeah. It's just incredible. And I'm very hopeful, uh, as, as easy as it is to think that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> <laughs> I think that happens when you get older. You know, the 20-year-olds don't have the perspective and know what, you know, they don't know how it was at the beginning of the AIDS crisis, yeah. you know, and how awful it was. That's in the past. Right. Um, but, you know, the world is theirs now, and they, they're going to create their own world, and, you know, they'll look at this day as their history. Yeah. Um, but go live out loud. Be yourself and have a good time. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks, Brandon. Really fun to be here. Yeah, this was great. <laughs> I love your shop, too. This is a great place. I, you've done a really good job. And I do consider myself an expert retailer. <laughs> and I think you're doing retail on a really, really uh, good, in a really good way. And I do feel you have community here, which to me is the magic retail. Awesome. Having a sense of community where the community wants to be. So yeah. well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. You bet. All thank right. You. And Islanders, I will talk to you on the next one. Well, a big thank you to Otto for joining me on the podcast today. And thank you for listening. Be sure to follow me on the Instagram at the command of voice as I continue to post as often as I remember, which my goal is three times a week. So let's see if I hit that. And for more information on this episode, you can go to commandocommons.com slash podcast. That's commandocommons.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening and see you next time.